All right, everyone. Uh, overnight, y'all went home and listened to the Bach Minuet in G. And so we're going to go over it today in class, and we're going to do a couple things with it. So we're going to listen to it now, and I want you to raise your right hand if you hear something that you felt like you've heard before in the piece. Now we're also going to also raise our left hand if you feel like you've heard something different. Um, so right hand, same, left hand, different. All right, now that we've gone through that, looking at this, we're going to go through it with the piece of music. And then here we go. There you go. All good. So it appears that the general consensus of what was demonstrated by the class was this sort of timeline in the piece of music. So, um, so whenever we're looking at the piece of music, what would y'all delineate as the first phrase? What would y'all think is the first phrase of the music? Through measure eight. Through measure eight, okay. So let's go ahead and mark up with our pencils, measure eight. Okay, so we'll mark through measure eight, the first phrase, right? And let's go ahead and call that phrase a lowercase a. And we're gonna also put like a little sort of arc like this through measures one through eight. First phrase, we're gonna mark it little a, okay? So, and then we said starting at measure nine, we felt like we heard something similar, right? So what do we call a phrase that is similar to the one before it? Prime. A prime, okay. So let's go ahead and call that. And so let's go like this. We'll do nine through 16, a prime. So if we have two phrases in an overall period that are similar, what do we call it? What do we label the period as? Parallel period, right? Parallel period. So now we're gonna do this and put parallel period. Okay, so we're also gonna label this large parallel period as a large A, right, as the first section. And so if we look at the piece of music, we see the repeat sign at the end of measure 16, meaning that we just go back over what we just listened to, right, which explains our right hands being raised, signifying that we've heard something similar, right? So we're just gonna do the same thing and just go A parallel period, okay? So now this is where we started to signify that there's something different going on in the music, right? So where would y'all think the next phrase is in this second, or this different part of the music? 17 through the end of 24. Okay, so let's go ahead and mark on our papers. And we're gonna put a B there because it's different and we haven't heard it before. So let's go and put like something like this on our paper and put a lowercase b, and that'll be measures 17 through 
24. Okay. And then we also felt like the next phrase was something we hadn't heard before, right? So let's go ahead and put another arc over that. And we're just going to put, let's put a little C there. How about that? So at measure 25, we're just going to put a little C and put an arc over measures 25 through 32. Um, and so we noticed that there was also a repeat at the end of that, right? Meaning that we go back, which explains the reason why we heard the similarity, correct? So let's go ahead and just do this kind of thing again. So we labeled this period A. If this period is not the same as this one, what do you think we should call it? B, okay. <laughs> and now for what Justin was saying, if these two fr uh, phrases are different in a period, what do we usually call that period? Contrasting. A contrasting period, there we go. Alrighty. And so we're just gonna do the same thing with here. Okay, contrast. Okay, so now looking at the overall form of the piece, so we're just going to look at everything up here. We see that we have a form of consisting of A, A, B, B. Does anybody have any clue what we would call this form? Okay, so this form is a large form called binary form. Form is something that composers use whenever they're composing their music. Do any, anybody have any clue why they would use form whenever they're composing? Any ideas being thrown out there? Hmm. So that other composers can copy other composers. Okay, so we can say uh, other composers copy it. All right, any other? For structure, okay. Continuity. Continuity. Now what about if we're thinking from a listener's perspective? Anybody have any clue why? Then you know what to expect. Okay. Makes it easier to follow or shadow. Know what to expect. And you said... Makes it easier to follow. Easier to follow. Easy to recognize. Mm -hmm. Let's go with... Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Um, so these are just a few reasons that we would probably use form in as a composer, right? Um, so overall, we learned today that about binary form and that it's an AABB form. And most of the time this form is used in the classical and Baroque eras, mm. mainly because composers, like we said over here, like to give uh, their followers pieces that, that are easy to follow and easy to recognize so that they can sell them easier, right? I mean, musicians don't make a lot of money, so the best way to make money is to make catchy tunes, right? And I don't know about y'all, but I thought that tune was pretty catchy. Um, so, and overall we learned that the main reason for form is that the composers want to make sure that there's structure in the music. I like this one with that the other composers can copy it so that there's a continuity between pieces, as said here. And thank y'all for coming to class today. Y'all are dismissed.